mind strength, like we'll talk about today. And then last week, we got a little more specific. We talked about small groups and just that they're not really part of the church, that they are the church. And we see, if you research and you look at the New Testament, we really see the, the first church, that's how they got together. They got together in small groups. And so if we are going to grow larger, we have to grow smaller at the same time and continue to keep that small group and all the different things they did in the small group and the family groups or the homes or the cell groups, whatever you know, we want to call those things. And so I uh, can't tell you how important that is. And so we are having Sunday school, a uh, new Sunday school starting up next week. Great time to, to uh, jump into those, one up here and one in the basement. Um, there's always the, the Tuesday ladies Bible study as well. They're going through Elijah, I think, right? Jah or is it Elijah? Jah. Ja. Okay, it's Elijah. And then uh, we're having our small groups, the four that are on the back. So take a look at those when they're starting and who they're with and and maybe um, uh, sign up for one of those. And we're uh, again starting uh, moms together. Definitely need uh, some help with daycare with that. I would hate to see those ladies not be able to meet simply because they don't have uh, daycare during the day. So get with me or Emily to, to continue to see if you can maybe just give one or maybe two times to help out with that. So we're talking about the plan. So today is a, a, a we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2 if you want to put your finger on that. Matthew chapter 2 verse 34. But what's the plan of loving God? Very we've heard this before. I know that and it's one message that we will continue to talk about often and it's one that we always have to kind of come back to and get our compass lined up where you know it really needs to be because here's the thing if we aren't loving god first everything else we do just doesn't make that much sense if we're not loving god first then our small groups aren't going to really make that much sense they're just going to be a bunch of us kind of getting together and and talking about stuff um if we're not loving god first with the bible club it's not going to make a lot of sense in fact it'll just become more work It'll become tiring. It'll become a chore. It'll become a duty. Uh, and we won't see the, the big picture with things. If you guys are just going to come to church and you're not going to love God, it's going to become extremely boring. And you won't get much out of it. If you're just coming for an experience, then, then that's, as, that's as much as you're going to get. If you're going to go on a mission trip and you don't really love God first, it just doesn't make sense. You're just going, again, just for an experience. You're kind of just going uh, to see what it's all about. And that's as much as you're going to get out of that thing. But when we have this love for God first, and that's our first step, it changes the perspective of everything that we do. And that's why we need to keep that in the forefront of everything we're doing. Is there like music playing in the background? Oh, does that help? <laughs> if I preach with a little bit of music in the background? It's like all nice. And <laughs> poor Patty. It's like, oh, no, there it goes. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> And I can start doing the waltz or some dancing or something. It's lovely music. But so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 22. Um, there are a lot of commands. I don't know if you've ever actually, you know, if you read through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, there are a lot, a lot of commands. And one of the questions that even I think we ask all the time, we're always doing the top 10 list. You know, who's in the top 25? Who's in the top five? It comes to sports. We're always talking about who's in the top 10 of this and that. Uh, we like lists. You know, we like to see if you were to choose What's the most important thing out there? You would, uh, you know, you'd have some. What's your favorite food? All these types of things. We always kind of want to know, you know, what's the top of the top of, of your list. Um, and if you look at the commands, there's about, this could be debated, there's about 613 commands, at least in the Old Testament, from all the old, uh, you know, the old covenant. And so all these rabbis and these guys that knew the law, that taught the law, that learned from the law, they had that debate all the time. They had the debate of, all right, so if we have all these commands, what's, a, what's a, the most important one when it comes to God? What do you think his top five is? What do you think his top two is? What do you think his top one is? Um, not too long, when I was in high school, I don't know if you guys like these. I, I don't know if this is just an older thing or what, but in high school, I love to do puzzles. Anybody love to do puzzles? Who loves to do puzzles? Raise your hand. I want to see. And puzzle lovers. Come on, put them up. Be excited. Don't be afraid. There you go. I know, it's kind of a nerdy thing, isn't it, uh, to put puzzles together. But when I was in high school, I'd be in my basement, my, my parents' basement. It was kind of our TV room, and i have the little car table up, and I would be doing my nerdy little puzzle. And if I had a friend come over, I was like, oh, no, that's my parents. I don't do puzzles. You know, they're, they're old people. They do that kind of thing. 
But I, I don't know. I love it. I love that the fact that even if you walk by a puzzle, you just want to put like one piece in, right? You just want to at least do one, just one piece. And then if it's not your puzzle and you find out, you can always get mad uh, with that person. But there's nothing worse than doing a puzzle and then not having that last piece, right? That missing piece you always talk about. It's like, tear the place apart. Kids, stop what you're doing. We've got to find that one piece. Or it's not even worth doing sometimes. You feel like you just wasted all that time. Uh, offhand, uh, we had a puzzle not here just too long ago, really hard one, and we had a little kid, two-year-old, and I heard throwing in the background, and I, we spent probably three, four hours on it already, and he was taking the pieces and chucking them. I walk in, I was like, oh, you kid, I'm just gonna, <laughs> man. And so we just threw it in the box, we were done. No way, I'm putting back, you know, I'm not doing the border or anything on the puzzle. But the, here's the deal, the missing piece When it comes to our walk with Christ, without a doubt, it's not the love of the church. It's not the love of of people. It's the love of God. It's having the love all the way through. That's what we see from the very beginning of the Old Testament. We see the very end of the New Testament, that underlining, overlining, whatever it is. It's the love that we see that brings everything definitely together. So the question is this, though. It's a big question to ask. Um, You know, what do you love most in life? That's a big question to ask. You know, what do you love? What, you know, what makes your heart skip? What, do you, what are you always anticipating? What are you always kind of just looking forward to? And that is a big question I think that we need to, as Christians, always be asking on a regular basis. If you had to choose today one thing, you know, what would that one thing be? Now, I, we believe here, you know, definitely the church exists uh, to make disciples of Jesus who love God and who love people in the same way that God loves us. And in fact, I think it's very difficult uh, to love people if we don't have the love for God. And a lot of things don't make sense. So let's just look at the background here. If you're in Matthew chapter 2, verse 34. This is the setting before we read it. This is the week. They call it the Passion Week. Uh, this is the week that Jesus comes in uh, and on a donkey. This is the week that we celebrate the, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, this passage is on a Wednesday. We see it. Um, they get very specific on each and every day. It's a few days uh, before he would go to the cross. So Jesus is in the temple in Jerusalem. He's rode in on the donkey. He's told everybody in the town his mission was to show that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And so we definitely see that he was attacked you know, by religious uh, people. You see that he's trying to get called out. He kind of cleanses the temple by throwing the money changers. That was on Tuesday with him throwing everybody out of the temple. And this is Wednesday when he says this. Many people are following Christ at this point. A lot of people are amazed at how, who he is. But obviously there's a lot of people who are wanting to discredit him. And they're asking him these questions. Um, so let's see what happens in, in, in verse Uh, 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with with the question. So we see a man in the crowd asking him these questions. And it's interesting, too. I think, um, you know, what kind of questions do you ask people? A lot of times, are you asking, because this could be one way that they could really want to be really trying to find the answer here sincerely and really trying to ask real questions or we're just asking questions for a hidden agenda. I mean, how many times do we do that? How many times do we ask questions because it's a selfish reason we're asking the question? And how many times do we ask the question because we really do care about the person or the situation? Or we're just asking questions to fulfill some selfish need really inside us. And again, if we don't have love on our underlining and the things that we do and the actions that we have and the words that we say, we tend to go right back to our own power and our own desires. Uh, Verse 36, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I love that they're trying to trip him up here. They're trying to ask him a very difficult question, and he doesn't say, you know, all the commands, of course, and kind of puts them together, and they're all important. He just says, comes right out and says, yeah, there's two. There's two, and here they are. So our ears should kind of perk up. We should really look at this and say, okay, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. Second is equally like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two 
commandments. Jesus explains the greatest, most important part of life. To, and I kind of steal this from another guy. You've maybe seen this many times in other places. To love God and to love people. That's it. I mean, that covers a huge chunk of what we should be doing personally, individually, and as a church. To love God and to love people. So number one, uh, the fill in here, learn. We need to learn to respond to God's love. A lot of us know this love. A lot of us have heard about this love. A lot of us have seen this kind of love, but it is not, we're not responding to it like we need to. 1 John 4, 19, here it is. It's not difficult, it's not complex, but this is why we do what we do. We love because he first loved us. That's why. That's why we do what we do. Not because we have a hidden agenda, not because we make it feel good for us, not because we could get something from it, but simply because Christ loved us First, When we understand that he has given us life and how blessed we are to even to have the things that we have, to have air, to have food, to have sunshine, to have shelter, to have clothing, it all comes from the love of God. Nothing else. We need to respond for who he is, his love and his patience and his kindness and his grace and his forgiveness for us. It should be overwhelming to us. You know, every important relationship that we have, you know, started at the beginning of something. And I've, I've joked about when I met uh, my wife, Wendy, you know, when she walked through the door of the campus center. We were talking about this yesterday. Her hair is flowing, you know, in the background, and it was slow motion, and her angels kind of going, oh, and I was like, that's the one for me. You know, I, that didn't really happen. Uh, <laughs> kind of happened. Um, you know, that was the first time, you know, I met her. And, of course, you know, the day that we get married, that's the day we're like, all right, this is the commitment. I love you. I mean, it's kind of, you look at this time, there's a, a relationship. When I had my four kids, it's the first time I kind of met my four children. That's where I kind of began my relationship. But with Christ, that relationship is already there before we're even born. He already did what he needed to do on the cross. And that's where we need to start. And that's where we need to respond to who he is and what he is uh, to us. Um, so let's unpack um, this here real quick. But when we look at um, what that, that word is, love, I know we, we, you hear this a lot, but it is this agape love. It's a different type of love than you see throughout the Bible. It's a totally unselfish love. It's a love that o is only possible with the strength that God gives us to have. The love of God is not this momentary feeling or emotion that changes back and forth. It's this logical, very specific thing. So let's look at how he wants us to love him. Uh, love God with all of your heart. Number two, love God deeply and personally with the heart. The word for heart means the, the physical, emotional, and the spiritual life of, of who we are as human beings. The heart represents the very, very core of who we are. It's our motivations, it's our words, it's our actions, it's our very life. You know, not a lot of theologians, a lot of theologians, when you look at this, and they, they, they take this verse, they definitely would say that the heart and the soul and the mind definitely overlap a little bit on the, you know, what are these specifically when it comes to the heart. But a lot like it, you know, it's like the ship, you hear this example a lot, but it's very, very true. If our heart is the rudder of a ship, Wherever we are lined up with that rudder, that's where the whole body goes. That's where a whole life tends to go. Matthew 6, 21 says, whenever you treasure is, that is where the desires of your heart is also. All right, wherever your treasure is, there are the desires of your heart also. So whatever is driving your ship, that is really what you treasure. And Jesus is saying, I want you to treasure me. That's what I want you to have. That's where I want you to be. Paul wrote that we are to count everything, everything on a loss in comparison to who Jesus is. Our children, our spouses, our job, our career, whatever we're looking forward to this week, whatever we're looking forward to in a month. Philippians 3.8 says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all garbage, so that I could gain who Christ is. I mean, we've got to ask that question often as Christians. What do we really believe is absolutely number one in our lives? We so badly want to put both feet in both places, right? We want to just get kind of comfortable with other areas of, of this world. And he's asking, it's very black and white. Folks, it's very black and white. And without us understanding what that love is, it's very difficult to understand a lot of what else God tells us. The status quo. 
equals the way things are. That is what kind of religion becomes when we talk about it. That becomes emotions. That becomes just doing the motions. But if we don't have love in the middle of those things that we see in the church, then it's just not going to last. It's not going to sustain. It doesn't make sense why we would do what we do as a church if we don't have love as the underlining definition of why we do it. All right, love God with all your soul. Devote your life to God. This is that devotion that we see. We see the Greek word actually uh, means to breathe. Others uh, would say the, the, the words of the soul is kind of maybe the seat. And we have all these things going on around us. We have all these emotions going around us. We have all these experiences going around us. And we, the, the soul would be the seat on how we react to those things on the outside, those emotions. What are we doing with those actual things in us? You know, it's, we can be passionate. As Americans, we can be passionate about a lot of different things in this world, right? We're allowed to be passionate. We can be passionate about football. We can be passionate about food. We love being passionate about food, right? How many uh, cooking channels are on you know, cable. How many, who watches cooking channels? I don't understand people who understand. But just, I want to see them. Come on. There's a lot. I know. Put it up with, yeah, I, I watch those and I'm like, hmm, all right, good, good. I don't know. But fine. Um, we, but passionate about food on those, those food networks. I mean, um, we're, we're allowed to be passionate about a lot of things, but if we become passionate about who God is, it stirs up way too much emotion, right? It stirs up way too many questions. And God is asking that passion is uh, that breath. It's that soul of who we are. And it's having the, the, the passion in our, our, our talk. It's in the passion of our actions uh, that really show what is steering this ship uh, that is ahead of us. It's really what you're looking forward to. Are you looking forward to God or are you looking forward to other things in this world? The soul is literally a part of us that defines really, I believe, who we are as a person. Because of the, the decisions we make, right? The choices that we make in some become who we are. Like it or not. The choices that you're making today and the decisions you're making today becomes really who you are. That's why I'm always yelling at the kids, you know, make good choices. I don't know if you've ever said that as a parent. Make good choices. That they are a sum of who you are. A devoted life is a life that actually shows that we are devoted to Christ. Does our life show that? When Jesus is our greatest treasure in the world, when he becomes that treasure, it leads to a life that is deeply, deeply devoted. Not halfway, not kind of. Our life decisions will line up with our affections. And this is what it means to love God with all of our soul. All right? Love God with all of our mind. What is that? What does that mean? Number four, renew your mind with God's truth. You know, our brain, it, it doesn't shut off. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes it's hard for me to get to sleep because my brain just keeps going. And if I get stuck on one task at night right before I'm trying to go to sleep, it's over with. I, I, got, I just can't get, uh, get settled whatsoever. The brain never stops. Uh, when you're sleeping, you're still dreaming, right? It's still going. The mind is a, a very, very weird uh, thing. I don't know if you guys remember Gilligan's Island. Uh, in an episode one time where uh, they ate some kind of fruit and then they were able to read each other's minds. Anybody remember that episode? And they hated each other by the end of that episode because they could read everything that was going on in each other's minds. I mean, the mind is a weird and crazy thing that we have, but the scriptures tell us that we have to kind of relearn, we have to retrain, we have to renew our minds is what it says in Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is uh, good and is pleasing and is perfect. We start to think things differently, right? Through the eyes of Jesus instead of ourselves. Jonathan Edwards, I don't know if you guys know Jonathan Edwards. He was a guy back in the Great Awakening. once said, seeking God, seeking after God is the main business of a Christian. It means it's always on their mind. 
It's always there. It's always thinking, what would God do? It's always thinking, where's the church here? Where's Jesus here in this situation? At work, with my relationship, with this confrontation I just had, with a decision I have to make, with this friend that just got me angry. I mean, it's everything. With my children, with my spouse, with my boss, with the people that, are, that work under me. You're always just thinking those things through and going through the, the, the love of God through every single one of those situations. How do we seek after God, is it in our thoughts? Are we thinking about him often? Or are we just coming to think about him when we're in trouble or when we come to church or when we are in these situations where we're supposed to be thinking of God? Or has he renewed your mind where it's always on God? You know, we don't get um, the love of God through, you know, a hip transplant or uh, operations or, you know, we can't just put those things inside us. The only way we can be transformed is we have a renewing of the mind. Romans 12, 1. A renewed mind results from diligence, diligently pursuing the knowledge of God. We are consistently and constantly seeking God and who he is. Anybody who despises that, anybody who despises knowledge like that, you can, you can, you can pretty much bet they're probably not following God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They despise it. Number five, we do everything for God. Everything for God. Mark uh, 12, 30 says, You must love the Lord your God with all of your strength. Loving God with our strength means to love him exceedingly, you know, richly, lavishly, everything, 100% of who we are. I mean, it signifies a, an output of energy towards God. How many of us, when you go through something mentally, it's tough. You're like, oh, I need to wind down. I mean, we put a lot of effort towards things. Think about how uh, tired you get just doing physical labor. And we put that labor, that, that he's saying we do everything, even the physical part of who we are, towards uh, God and, and his, his love. You know, if we're going to be a, a couch potato, I mean, when it comes to physical of who we are, we can't just expect us to be fit. Because, um, you know, we just want it to happen. You know, you get to my age, it's, it's really depressing. Sorry for you 20 year uh, and 30 year olds. It's hard, man. You, you eat a Big Mac and it's over for like two weeks to try to get that thing off. Right? And before, when you're young, you just kind of hope that you lose weight and it seems to just melt off. You're like, I, I hope, I, hope I, I lose 10 pounds. Boom, it's gone. But not when you get past some age, at least the age where I'm at. And we just kind of hope that things are going to fall into our lap. You know, we just kind of hope that maybe uh, I'll just get it someday. But we have to have this pursuing. We have to have this want to know who God is or we'll never understand him. And he says to do everything uh, through him. So, you know, that's uh, the plan. The plan is to love God. The plan is to love God from the very, very beginning with everything that we are. And here's the key. When we start to love God, we start to love the people that are around us. It's very difficult to love people and not have the love of God inside us. It's a lot of work. And in fact, I think we just burn out. In fact, I think we just kind of give up. It's too much work because that's all it ends up really being is work. And so think about how you deal with people. Think about how your relationships are right now. You know, are they good? Are they rough? Is it hard to love people when you see them? Is it hard uh, to um, see when you see somebody in need? Do you kind of turn and run? Do you, do you try not to be noticed so you can just go on with your own life? And does it seem exhausting? It's going to if you don't love God first. But when we start to love God first, we start to love the people around us. And the things that we do in this church start to make a lot of sense. There's somebody that told me this, I'll close kind of with this, is that you know, life is about 90% of what happens to it, or 10% about what happens around us, and 90% of how we respond to it. Think about that. Life is about 10% of what happens around us, and about 90% on how you actually respond in the situation. And God is saying, if you're going to love me with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, then, then it's everything. It's got to be everything. It can't just be some things you want. How are you responding? Are you responding with arguments? 
Are you responding with excuses? Are we responding with, oh, you know, the world this day, I just don't get it anymore. I don't know. These young bucks, these kids, these, these days. Are we saying, you know what, how are we going to love the people that need Jesus? How are we going to love the people that do love Jesus, that are struggling? What are we going to do? So I hope that when we start doing some of the things in this congregation, that that it becomes the, the underlining reason why we do what we do. And so uh, next week, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about loving people. And uh, we pushed back the um, one simple thing we can, I mean, there's a thousand different things, but just as a group that we can do together as a family is we usually have this picnic that we always do, right? You guys ever notice that we didn't have it? Anybody notice? We didn't have the uh, potluck at the, at the park? Nobody noticed, right? Oh, someone did. Okay. Um, we always do like a corn a whole tournament, kind of just hang out and have our potluck. We're going to do that still, but we're going to have it out front here. The reason I want to push it back, because it's a thousand degrees usually when we do it, and there's flies everywhere, and it's kind of miserable, and you need some trees for some shade. I want to do it out here, though, mostly for the reason, because I want to be able to invite the people in our neighborhood. You guys all know about this, this uh, apartments, you know, just uh, right over here. Um, they're rough. Uh, some of the worst places I've seen, and I've been to a lot of rough places in my life. It's time for us to get out and start out and inviting our neighbors, start looking at the people around us. And if there's one little tiny thing we could do, we can invite them over for some food and say, hey, come on over. We're right here. This is our neighborhood. These are the people that are right next to us. And if we're going to have the love of God, we've got to have the love of people follow that. And so I want to be able to have a few of you just come with me and, and go through those hallways and, and give them a little, hey, we're going to have a, a potluck uh, and, a, and a few Sundays on the 26th. Love to have you. We're going to have some inflatables out here. We're going to have a, a real competitive cornhole competition because that's important. Um, me, and, me and Will are the, uh, the champions of the uh, fair one that just happened. So bring it, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, we're going to have fun. I want to, but if, if just one person comes to that that we don't know as a congregation, I hope they are just overwhelmed by God's love. I want some of the things that we do be very, very pointed in underlining loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving people. If you haven't made that decision, I don't know where you're at, some of you. Um, we always just give a, a time where you can come forward on Sunday morning. Maybe you haven't really responded to God's love yet. And when we sing is always a good time. It doesn't say that in scripture that when you sing that that's when you have to come forward. It's just when we do it. But it's a great time to come up here. If you're ready, we can fill the baptism up and we can give you some clothes and we can do that right here, right now and not wait, not give any excuses anymore to give your life to Christ fully and totally um, like Christ has asked us to. And those of us who already have, this is how we're going to do things. We're going to do things with the underlining uh, idea that we love God and that we love his people uh, around us, whoever we can get in the way of and whoever he puts in front of us. All right, let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for today. I thank you for this congregation. Um, Lord, we're not perfect here, Lord, by any stretch of the imagination, but Lord, we're, we're faithful to you, Lord, and we give our lives to you. And, Lord, I don't know where some are here. If it's time for them to give their life uh, fully and devoted to you, I pray that they do. I pray they come and talk to me or come up here and, and share it with the world and share it at least with this congregation. And, Lord, you know where we are this morning. Sometimes we just always need to get that compass right back on to you, pointing right to you. So, Lord, I pray that, that in everything we do, all of our speech and all of our actions, what we do with our children, what we do with our spouse, what we do at work, what we do in all these committee meetings and and different things that we're involved in, I pray to all just center around you and your love. I pray that we can really understand that to, 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 to be your church, we have to love you first. And uh, then we can open our eyes and really see the people around us that, that you love so much, and so we love them as well. Father, I love you. I thank you for this congregation. I pray you continue to give us direction uh, when it comes to those things so that we can be in your will. It's the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen. If you want to stand, we'll close with our closing song. So, yes, we have a few things going on. Uh, do check out the back there. Uh, it's got the sign-ups for uh, the small groups. Some of them are starting this week, a good chunk of them in a couple weeks. So um, keep track of that. And we got the um, back-to-church picnic we'll be doing on the 26th. And so great time to invite a friend.
and we'll start passing those things out around the neighborhood, and uh, hopefully we can uh, do that well. It'll be a, a great afternoon. Hope you guys have a great week. It is really good uh, to see you all. I love you guys. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.